uh, James chapter 2 this morning. And last week we talked about the importance of living the Christian life and not being fake and phony. And we talked about genuine love, didn't we? We talked about how important it is that we truly are uh, people who love the Lord, people who love uh, those people around us. And it's very important uh, that we act upon the work that God has done in our life. And we talked about how important it was that we actually condescend to men of low estate. You remember we did a, a word study on that word condescend. And it isn't like man sees it, a condescending attitude, but it's actually how God uses it as a caring attitude, one that's able to reach down, uh, one that actually leaves their uh, privilege of their superiority or their rank of some place of great dignity, and they actually do an act or share kindness or reach out to one that is inferior. And in fact, it actually implies that someone relinquishes or steps down from their place of betterment to those who need assistance in the lowerment, if you would, those that uh, are in a poor condition, those that are in a helpless condition. And we read verses last week about how we need to be very careful that we are not of the attitude of what? Be ye warmed and filled. Don't. Uh, the Bible is clear. When we have something in book Proverbs that says, uh, say not to thy neighbor, go thy way and come again, when you have with you that which he needs to meet his need. We are to give to those that have need. And in fact, when the Bible, I just say this, there's so much on this. The Bible says about our giving heart, of our helping heart, and in, in, in how we're not just to be hospitable when people come to us, but we're also to reach out with hospitality. We're, we're to reach out with help. That He said, if a man bids you to go one mile, go with him twain. That was referring to the Roman soldiers that were hated who had to be helped carrying their burdens. They were allowed to command anybody at any point and say, as a Roman guard, you carry my burden. And that man was required by Roman law to carry that burden for the Roman soldier. Jesus knew that was a, a thing of that day. And he said, look, if that man tells you to go a mile, you go with him twain. You do beyond your duty as a Christian. You stand above the acts of kindness uh, that should be done of your duty. And then he also said for him that has one cloak or two cloaks, what did he say? Give to the one that has none. So that really shows to us. And, and there are uh, I think 2,600 verses in the Bible that deal with our possessions and money and things that we have been made uh, stewards of. So God does care about what we do with what we have, and, and we need to remember that. And we dealt a little bit with that last week. You know, We can't say, oh, man, we wish I could do something to help you, and here we have some way of helping that person. That would be really, it would be the opposite of Christianity to the fullest. Christ gave all so that all could come unto him. Let's just remember that, you know. And, and I know that we're not charismatic here. We don't say, oh, sow a seed of faith and God will bring back to you a hundredfold. We don't preach that message, but we do know God blesses those that are a blessing. It's, it's a biblical principle. And, um, you know, the reality of it is if God leads you to do something and you don't do it and you're, you're deceptive, and you act like it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, the Bible says, they came and they said, here's what we sold our property for. And, and Peter said, oh, yeah? And then the wife comes in, you know, and, and sees her, didn't know her husband was dead. And Ananias has already been carried out because he lied and said, oh, yeah, I agreed. Or I paid, you know, this much for it. And this is what we sold the property for. And they laid the money at the apostles' feet. And the Bible says his wife came in. And they had also both agreed to lie. And God said, you didn't lie. Peter said, you didn't lie to me. You lied to the Holy Ghost. You, you have despised what God is leading us to do as a church. And people think, well, you know, it's no real big deal if I don't participate in what God is wanting the church to do. Oh, yes, it is. It's a very big deal. I'm glad that God is not in the killing business uh, of what we see there in the book of Acts. But the Bible says there was great fear on the church. And we ought to fear if we are not... Uh, responsible with what God has given to us, to do what God wants us to do with it. And, um, and I know that that's hard for us to really think about because we're so 
We feel so important the more that we have in this world, but the reality is God has an important work for us to do with what we have in this world, and we need to be very wise stewards of that. Amen? Oh, that was easy. Okay. So uh, James here says again, we're supposed to condescend. We're supposed to uh, even come to the point where we are not like the world does. We're not condescending in the sense of looking down, but we're rather in a scriptural sense, we're reaching down to help man. We're, we're working the work of God through us. Amen. And uh, many people have made songs about this, but the reality that the body of Christ is Christ working. God uses us as his hands and feet. We need to remember that. And, and sometimes as Baptists, we've gotten so much away from the social gospel of feeding people and helping people and clothing people and pantries and all these things that we think, well, our job is just simply to go to church and then go witness to people. That's what we're supposed to do and nothing more. But that's not the reality of it because James is reminding here to these believers when he said in chapter 2, my brethren, that we have a duty to be responsible and to help those around us. In fact, he says in verse 8 that this is what we are doing. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And he tells us here, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So God says here, you know, you can be right and say you're right, but if you don't show forth this love, and, uh, you know, we, we saw something else very interesting, too, that in verse number 5, we need to remember this. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? These people in the world that have needs and those of us who have greater ability to give to their needs, they are praying for God to provide for their needs. And who will they use? Who will God use to help that person in their need? The one who's praying, saying, God, what is it you want me to do with what you have given me? And God will direct that person. I could tell you stories from now until Jesus comes of things that's happened in my life and things that have happened in other Christians' lives where they're praying earnestly, saying, oh, God, I need a miracle. And God spoke to someone's heart and said, go, do this for this person. And because that person obeyed and because the first person prayed, there was a connection made here and their faith was richened. Their faith was increased. And uh, there's tests in life God puts you through to, to try your faith, to trust him. When the situation is hopeless and unless we are uh, willing to be used of God to help someone, then that faith cannot be increased. In fact, what they'll do is they'll say, Lord, I don't understand what happened. I don't understand why you didn't come through. Um, maybe because that one there didn't listen to do what God told them to do. And uh, I remember reading a book about George Mueller, and a man came to him like 2 o'clock in the morning, and he said, I can't sleep. I've been fighting God for a week and a half. He's been telling me to give this money to the boys' home and to feed the kids, and I just said, no, I can't. It's, it's my money, and it's my business, and I've been fighting with God. And he said, I'm not fighting anymore. Well, it makes you wonder what, what happened in that week and a half that maybe that boy's home went lean or didn't have you know, everything that they needed or could have had a, a little bit more blessed time, if you would. So it's, it's a very interesting subject there uh, to know that. God does his part. But we all, must also do our part. Okay, so we, we've got that, all right? They're rich in faith. And again, they have no earthly provider. They're helpless, so it's our job to be used to God to help them. And they feel that no one cares for them. God he wants to use us to let them know. In fact, we found last week in Matthew 25, Jesus said, whatsoever you've done unto them, you've actually done it unto me. If we despise those who have needs in this world and we do not help them as God directs us to help them, the Bible says we are actually despising God. Please remember that, okay? God is telling to us that, that we are offensive to him in a sense. In fact, verse 10 now, we're going we're gonna to come forward. The writer here, James, stops for a minute. And this is often used when we are presenting the gospel with somebody. But the context of this verse is the fact that God is saying to us, we can keep the law and we can try to do what's right in the word of God, but when we see those whom are at a lesser state than we are, and we do not honor them as God's people. We do not treat them as God sees them. And if we have respect of persons, as it says in verse number one of our chapter, 
and we do not see them as God sees them according to their heart and their needs, then the Bible says basically we're breaking God's law, which is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I want you to see this here today. Go, as we read on, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offended in one point, he is guilty of all. What's the context here? Helping those. Being loving, being kind, being caring to the ones that don't look well. To the ones that don't look the same as we do. To the ones that don't have the same skin color as we do. Maybe as a man, can I say this? Man sometimes, men sometimes are derogatory towards women. We shouldn't be that way as Christians. Women shouldn't be derogatory towards men either. Sometimes, you know, it goes both ways. We should treat one another with the same respect as the children of God. It should be important to that. And again, are there classes in the Bible when it comes to Christianity? You understand what I say by classes? A dualistic system like England is, you have the lords and you have the subjects. You have a king, a monarchy, and then you have the subjects of that monarchy. You know, what we have here in America is supposedly upper class, lower class, right? But there's classes of people. Does God see classes of people? The answer, of course, is no. He does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward. God looks what? On the inward. Now, verse 11, the context here. Paul, uh, James is trying to get us the idea here. It says, for he that said... Do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now, verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. I believe we see something here that's greater than just a giving of kindness. But mercy is when you give something to someone that they don't deserve. And stay with me. Grace is when you, you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is when you... Wait a minute. Mercy is when you don't give what you do deserve. There we go. So mercy, the idea of mercy is that we are acting out in a kindness that someone does not deserve. Please understand that, okay? And uh, sometimes there are those that are in positions that are inferior because of things in their life. And God says we're not to look down upon them. We're not to treat them with disdain, all right? And the Bible says that mercy rejoices against judgment. So the Bible is telling us here it says in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? What does James keep saying in this book? Right from the beginning. Right from the first chapter. He starts out in chapter 1, and, and, and this guy's real. James is real. He, he's not your phony, fake, feel-good preacher. He gives you some good doctrine, and then he points it right at your heart. That's I love I love conviction of the Holy Ghost. I love that we can read our Bibles, but the Spirit of God is always going like this to us, pointing at us, saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? And he, he begins James chapter 1, and he talks about prayer, and he talks about how God wants to do a work in, his life, in our life, and then he says, but a double-minded man is unstable in his all his ways. You better get your heart, your mind, your life directed in the right way, and don't go after the things of this world. Don't go after the things of the flesh. And so that God can do something in your life. God wants to give you the wisdom of how to live. And, and then he goes on to say that the word of God is great for us in the chapter 1. And he says, but don't just be a hearer, but be a doer. He's constantly challenging us with what he is giving to us from God in this sound doctrine. He's saying, but look, it's not enough just to hear it. You need to do it. It's not enough just to pray, but pray in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. And, and here these reminders are coming up. And now in James chapter 2, he's saying, don't just tell me you have faith. Show me that you have faith. James is challenging our hearts to be the servants that God wants us to be. And that is the message I believe here, that God wants his children to show forth that faith and to be real. And uh, I think it's obvious uh, here as we read on. Watch, it says here in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, again, 
If you attend certain churches in America today, what I'm getting ready to read is what they will teach that teaches your works is part of your salvation in the sense of going to heaven. It is very important to understand that the work of God's salvation is still continuing in our life today. We are forever eternally saved in heaven. You have a reservation. That will not be taken away. But the emphasis of the scripture is not to lost people getting born again. Would you agree with me? Chapter 2's context is specifically dealing with how am I to treat my brethren in the world? How am I to treat mankind? How is it that my life is to reflect Christianity so that the world can see my faith? This is not about being born again. This is not about keeping your salvation. This is about justification before man. And I want to be very clear about that. Do you know when you find the word salvation in the Bible, it's not talking about, always about being born again? It's not what he's talking about. In fact, there's preaching in the New Testament that says, save yourself from this untoward generation. It's referring to living your life after you get saved. And then Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Timothy was a pastor. Timothy was in the faith as a young man. Timothy went with Paul and preached the word of God. He wasn't a lost man, but God told him through Paul, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Talking about the life he's living manifesting the work of Christ and people seeing that salvation's real in his life. Oh, you got salvation? Jesus Christ gave you eternal life, something you don't deserve? Then what are you giving to the ones around you who don't deserve God's grace, who don't deserve God's mercy? The same love? Are you manifesting the love that Christ gave to you through your life? Have you say you truly are a recipient of Christ's love? You know, John got real specific. He said, if any man hate his brother, he's a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. The reality of it is we have a love or a hatred for those around us. And if Christ's love is coming into us and we're born again, it certainly should be going through us. That's salvation. You, with, you see in the application here that James has given us? Watch, he says, and he gives us this act of, of, of doing what has been planted in our lives. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, that's verse 15, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it says here, uh, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So the reality is what? God's faith should be living in our lives. The work of God should be going through us. You know what God is really dealing with here? Hypocrisy. A, a, a sense of false Christianity. And, and this is a reminder all throughout the Bible. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, as by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God always brings us back to that point of, I laid down my life, now you lay down your life. I gave up myself and my will, now you lay down yourself and your will. It is a constant reminder that what love is, is not just a word, but an action. I don't know if you've studied that out in the Bible, but the word love is not a, a sense of emotion, it's a sense of action. The Bible always describes love in an action sense. Remember that. It's not a, oh, I love you. Oh, this is great love. The Bible says that love is seen, that love is acted upon, that love of a faith that works in our life brings forth works. All right, so you see it. Watch, if you would, in going on, verse 5, 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. But here he says, Show me thy faith without thy works. But I, or excuse me, James says here, but I will show thee my faith by my works. So what he's saying is there's fake Christianity, phony Christianity, and there's real Christianities. We cannot say, in fact, verse 19, he, this is pretty serious, guys. He equates, again, another verse that we use often when somebody needs to get saved, when they say, oh, I believe in God. We quote this verse. Again, it's not the context. The context is one that is not, 
uh, living this love of God through their life, he actually equates that person with the devils who say, oh, yeah, I believe in God, but who at this point have chosen to do the wrong thing. The angels that fell from heaven knew who God was, still know who God is, but they chose to do what they wanted to do in their life. And I like, I like to believe, this is my theory, the way that Satan got the, de the devils to follow him, <clears throat> and I believe this could be biblically supported, is that he told them, just as Christ's subjects and rulers, or those that reign with Christ will also reign, those who follow him, Satan de deceived those devils into saying, if you follow me, People will worship me and people will worship you. And I do believe people are worshiping devils today who are fallen angels. So the idea is they wanted self-glory, they wanted self-serving, and this is what God is equating us as believers with. Those who know the glory of God, get this please, and leave it to satisfy self instead of give up. And do the angels as you and I don't think it's a coincidence the Bible uses this verse. The angels describe or describe something in the Bible. Let's go back here. We've got to finish this real quick. We're out of time. Psalms uh, 106, I believe. Oh, God, help me find this. It, it might take me a minute, it might be back the other way. God, help me find this. Um, Let me search this in my Bible. Search. I know the words, and I don't think it might be here. Um, filling his will. No. Yes, we have a problem with our sound system. It's beeping. That is correct. Um, oh, okay. Here we go. Let me find this. We're at the end of the lesson. Nope, that's not there. So the, the scripture tells us, <clears throat> let me just look for a minute, see if I can find it here. Um, let me see if I can find it. I know it's at the top of my Bible here. But basically, the Bible tells us that angels fulfill his word. That's, that's the reality of it. God's, God has showed to us that the angels obey him. They, they do what God has commanded them to do. And so back in James here, we'll close. The idea is God is saying to us, you know, we say we're Christians. We believe in God. We're saved. The devils believe in God and tremble. But they chose to do the wrong thing. They cared for themselves. And, you know, as Christians, we don't want to be that way. Amen? And um, verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. All right. So let's be dismissed here uh, just by praying very quickly. I hope that um, you saw here a little bit of the comparison, the idea that we can't just, you know, pick and choose what God wants us to do but rather be a follower of him and not a follower of self and, and desiring God's glory and not our own glory and desiring to worship him and not be worshipped ourself and, and be lifted up ourself, but rather the Bible says condescend here to men of low estate. So it's a good, good subject.